Today's half we're going to be learning is Baba Bakhtar Daf Samach. This is the Daf for Shabbat. We're going to get started from the very bottom of Nun Tadam Abet, Amal Rav Nachman. Okay, we finished with the story of someone who opened a window into the courtyard of someone else. And we had a cloak of Tumor Rishma Yossi about whether it was okay, there was already a Chazaki here or there wasn't. We had a few different interpretations. Now Rav Nachman comes and says, But least on the altar, Havi Chazak. She'en adam asoi shesotmim oro b'fanav v'shotim. Okay, so the Rashbam explains, what do we mean here? If you had a wall, a window there for three years and your friend came and blocked it, and you didn't say anything about the, the wall, then to the one who basically blocked your window. Okay, some people think it means, again, closing up your window because nobody would let Nobody would close your window and not comment on it if you really needed the light. So therefore, if you were silent when they tried to either block the window or close up the window, you know, block it by building a wall, then they create a chazaka on being able to do that. Now we go back to the line of the mission that says, if you took a house in a different courtyard, you can't open a window there to the shutafim, my time. It's because if you have an opening there, then you're going to basically take up more space, as we discussed in the Mishnah. You'll have the outside of your of your exit kind of going to, um, right? Even if it's a, right, you won't be able to have another entrance there, then you're basically, you can either say increasing traffic and then people are going to have a hard time walking around. Or the simple reading is, you're going to then kind of own some space there, or put some things there. And that will cause people to have to go around. It will inconvenience them. The problem is, Ema Seifa, but it says continuation. If you want to add people into your house, you can't make a second floor. It's going to take up space in the courtyard. Again, we talked about the ladder hanging out there, right? Or put basically taking up space in the courtyard, or perhaps just more people coming down into the courtyard. So what can you do though? You can be build another room within your house, and then make a, a higher level there, which we weren't really sure what that means. To which they say, also there, you're going to create more traffic, more people coming out, maybe the ladder, right? It's you're still going to have an aliyah there, although the truth is you won't have the ladder, but you will have more people, which are going to increase traffic. So So now they explain what have you done in the second the end part of the Mishnah? You've split your house into two. In other words, you don't build another house. What it means is you have another house, meaning you split your house in half, your built house. You just buy more living space. What you do is you then create a loft within the space that you already have. That you're allowed to do. You can squish more people into the space you already have built. You just can't build another level, okay? But if they're all living in what was called your house before, then they can all, can, you can even have more people living in your house, just like you can have more kids. You can't say, oh, you're increasing traffic in the courtyard. That would be ridiculous, right? Like, let's say you, you buy a house and then you slowly start having kids and you end up with eight kids and then, you know, there's tons more people in the courtyard. Well, they can't argue with that. So likewise, if you split your house into two, but, you're, but you're, what, the outer structure of the house remains the same. New Mishnah. If you're in a, a joint courtyard, you can't open a window opposite another one's window or a door opposite another one's door. Okay, okay. And then again, this is for privacy purposes. If you had a small door or small window, you can't make it bigger. If you had one door, you can't make two. We'll get it to this all in the Gemara. If you're a member, by the way, if you have two, what, what does that mean? It means you have more space in the courtyard for every, back to the beginning of the Masechet, for every opening, you get a four by four cubit space that belongs to you. But if you open up into the public domain, if there's a window in someone's house opposite you, you can open a window anyway opposite, because in any case, their window is already view by all the people passing by, your one window is not going to make much of a difference. And likewise, an opening against an opening. Right there also, you don't get the space outside your door is not your own in a public thoroughfare. 
Hayat katan ose oto gadol, ve'echad ose oto shnayim. But if it was small, you can make it bigger. And, right, same thing. In public domain, it doesn't really matter. And if it was one, you can make it two. So now the Gemara asks, Menaha Nebile, where do we get this from about not opening a window opposite another one's window? Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Amar Kha, Rabbi Yochanan says, the Pasuk says, Vayisa Bil'am et ena vayaret Yisrael shochen l'shvata. So Bil'am looked up and he saw the Jews dwelling in their dwelling places, right, in their tribes. Maha, what did he see that he was so amazed by? He saw that their openings to their tents weren't facing each other, again, for privacy issues. And what did he say? Right? And because of that, he said, it must be these people are worthy, but the presence of God is upon them because of this level of privacy that they have in their communities. If it was small, you can't make it large. So Rami Barhama thought to say that this means a four cubic entrance, you can't make it into an eight one, right? You can't make it bigger because then you're going to get more space. Instead of a four by four space, you'll get an eight by four space. Because then you're going to get eight in the courtyard. But if it's two, where anyway, in a two ama entrance, you're already going to get four by four. Because any entrance gets you four by four. So perhaps the Shabi Be Arba, Shapir Dami, maybe you could make it into four. So Amarle Rava, no. Matse Amarle, and that is Rami Barhama thought this was okay. But came Rav and he said, no, this doesn't work either, because they could say, You had a small entrance. So I was able, the neighbor says, I could have protected myself from my privacy from just a small entrance way. But Babit Rav, and now you have a big doorway. That's already Lomatsina leads to Noemine. It's already going to be much harder for me to protect myself from privacy from you because it's now a bigger opening. If you have one, you can't make two. So Savarami Barhamalamar Barba e Lola Shave Tre Bene Tarte Tarte. You can't take a four, which allows you a space of four by four, and make it into two separate entrances because if you break it in half and it's two separate entrances, then each one is going to get you four by four, and then you'll end up with eight by four. So that can't work. Because you're going to get eight in the courtyard. But maybe in eight, you can split into four and four. Right? If it was one big opening, you can make it two openings. But again, that's what Rami Barhama thought. Kalim's Ravan says no. So Rava claims that in a, if you have two openings, then one will stay closed and the other will mainly remain open. If you have one big opening, then you'll probably close it most of the time. Why exactly this is a good question, and at least that's one explanation I saw. But for some reason, it seems that two separate entrances are going to be less private than one big entrance. New uh, last line in the Mishnah, then we'll get to the next Mishnah. Um, so you can open an opening to the, the next, you know, into the public domain, even if it's opposite someone else's entrance or window. It's because he says, right, the neighbor could say, in any case, well, this isn't increasing my, if I want to open my window, opposite yours, but yours is already open into the public domain, I'm not really changing anything for you, because in any case, any, anyone in the public could look in, and therefore, it's not really changing anything. Okay, with this, we're going to start the last Mishnah of our chapter, and with that, we're going to finish this very long chapter of Hezkata Batim. And we're going to end, you'll see, in an interesting manner. Okay, we quoted this before, you can't make something that has a hole underground, okay, a bore, a shiach, a remember different types of, right, we started the chapter with this, interesting, they're ending with it, uh, the round, the cistern, or the long, narrow one, which is the shichin and the ma'arot, which is square and has a cover on it, either square or rectangular. Rabbi Leezer, so you can't do it because it might, right, even if you cover it, somebody might fall in, eventually the cover will wear away. Rabbi Leezer, matil, we had this, remember, Who's worried about the future? Who's not worried about the future? So Rabbi Lezer permits this. As long as a wagon can go, a carriage can ride on it carrying stones, it's very heavy. If that can go over it without anything happening, then yeah, sure, you can do it. 
You can't put small beams or wide beams because some people think it's a, the wide beams that often create, you make a merpeset, a porch out of it. You can't have that jutting out to the public domain, the Rishud Harabim. If you want to do it, what do you do? You can move your wall more into your property. And then you can put a protrusion out as long as it doesn't go into the public domain. So if you really want it, so move your property, your, your wall further in, and then you'll have enough space in your courtyard so it won't be jutting out into the public domain. But if you bought a courtyard, there already were in the, in the, you know, let's say from the wall of the courtyard jutting into the public domain, you can leave it as is. You don't have to start changing it. Seems that, right, people already must have permitted you somehow, and therefore you permitted the original owner. So if you move in, you can leave it. So you can't put it up, but you can leave it if it's already there. So now the, rab the Gemara starts off. So how do we explain the rabbi's position? Rabbi says, as long as it can hold an agala, it's fine. So what's wrong with the rabbis? Why can't you put up a bor shiach mara in the public domain that's all covered and protected? And the answer is because it might wear away at some point and people won't know and somebody might fall in and get hurt. And again, this is all preventative damages. Rabbi Ami, Havaleziza, Havaknafik Limavoa. So now we're going to see some interesting stories with rabbis who had some things that we'll see. Rabbi Ami had a ziz that was coming out into from his courtyard into the alleyway. Not the public domain, but an alleyway. Bahu Gavra, Nani Havaleziza, Dava Mafik Lirashud Arabim. And there was someone else who had one of these protrusions that went out into the public domain. So there's a difference here. One is in the public domain, one is in a mavoy in an alley. So B'nai Rishud Arabim came to the second person and said, hey, this is in our way, get it down. Take it down. So they came before Rabbi Ami. He came before Rabbi Ami and said, what am I supposed to do? They want me to take down my Z's. Do I have to? So Rabbi Ami said, yes, cut down your protrusion. It's in the public domain. To which the guy says to Rabbi Ami, but you also have one. Why is it okay for yours and not okay for mine? To which Rabbi Ami has a very obvious answer, which is, mine goes out into a mavoy. That's an alleyway that's owned by a certain number of people, not a lot. And they have no problem with it, so I'm good. But yours, yours goes into the public domain. And man there's no such thing as all the people in Rashid Arabim saying it's okay. Obviously, it wasn't okay for some people. They complained. And there's no way to take a poll of the entire public domain, all the people living there. So there's no way to allow it. So Rabbi Ami basically distinguishes between his case and the other person's case. But now we're going to see a similar story with something else where it was a little bit different. Rabbi Yanai, Havala Ilan Hanotel Rashid Arabim. Rabbi Yanai had a tree that was going over into the public domain. There was someone with the exact same scenario where their tree was hanging over into the public domain. Well, people in the public domain went over to this person, not Rabbi Yana, but to the other person and said, hey, your tree's in our way. So he comes before Rabbi Yana. You can see where this is going, but this will be a little twist here. Amar so Rabbi Yana says to him, turning now to Amabet, Yana says, listen, go home and come back tomorrow and I'll tell you what to do. Rabbi Yana goes that evening and cuts his tree. Okay, he says, you know, I don't want him to see my tree or we'll see. So he cuts his own tree. So wakes up in the morning. The guy comes before him. He says, yeah, you have to cut your tree. Amarle, so the guy says to Rabbi Yana, he pulls out what he was prepared to say, Hamar Nami Ile, but you also have a tree protruding into Rashid Arabi. Obviously, he didn't check what happened last night. Amarle, Zil Chaze, so Rabbi Yana says, go check, go look at it. If mine is cut, then you cut yours. If mine is not cut, then then you don't have to cut it either. 
So now the big question is, Mi kara mai sabal, or the basaf mai sabal. What did Rabbi Yana think originally? They didn't cut it down. They only cut it down once the people started complaining to, you know, and this guy came to court before him. So if it was a problem, he should have cut it before this whole thing happened. It's a little bit fishy, the story, right? Just because the guy comes and Rabbi Yana says, oh, I better cut my, and he does it kind of surreptitiously so that he could set up this whole thing. It seems a little bit strange. So the real question is, first question is, why did he think it was okay? And then change his mind about it. He actually thought that it benefited the public because people had a place to sit in the shade in the public domain. Right? When I walk now, it's so hot out, right? You're thrilled to see any kind of shade anywhere. You don't care if it's private, public, right? You're just happy to have a tree there. But then he saw that the people complained about the other guy's tree. So Shadr Katsia, then he realized that his perception of what the public wanted, which is a fascinating question. How do we know what the public wants or doesn't want? Maybe they were bothered specifically by that guy's tree and not by Rabbi Yana's tree. But there's no way to really know. But once people complained, he realized, I better cut it. Now, second question. Why did he have to do it surreptitiously in the middle of, you know, at nighttime? And first of all, people didn't usually go out at night. He clearly did it in a way the other person wouldn't see. Why didn't he just say, Zil kutz didach vahadar ikutz didei? Why didn't he just say, that you go cut yours and I'll also cut mine? So the answer is, Mishum to Rish Lakish, based on what Rish Lakish says, the Amr hit kosheshu vakoshu, kshot atznacha vacharka kshot acherim. Okay, this is a passage from Tzvanya, which we learned to mean, right, first kshot atznacha, first decorate yourself, and then do it to others. In other words, always set an example first. So he wanted to have done it before the person did it, so that, okay, it doesn't really explain why he did it secretly, but it does explain why he managed to cut it before he told the person what to do. Next line in the Mishnah. So now we're with the case of disease. If right, you move your wall back and then you can do it. So now they say, If you move your wall inward in order, so the protrusion, you know, you'll then move your, you'll put back your protrusion and have it go out so that it's still within your courtyard. What if you then didn't put up a, a, a Z's? Are you allowed to do it later? Or can people say, look, we now what's gonna basically happen is like this. If you have a protrusion, right now it was going into the public domain. So that's bothering people. So you're gonna move it. But when you move it, basically, right now you take it down entirely. Let's say it's four, let's say it's in a cubit. Okay, let's just give it in as, as an example. So now you move your wall and you're going to put your protrusion back, but you don't yet. Now the assumption is the people in the public domain will slowly start walking more into your domain and using it as a public thoroughfare because there's nothing blocking their way from walking. So the question is, did they have rights to it once they've started using it? So Rabbi Yochanan Amal, Kanas Mutsi, Rish Lakish Amar, Kanas Ve'ino Mutsi. So Rabbi Yochanan says it's fine. You can bring it in and then later put on that new put that protrusion on. And Rish Lakish says, no, you can't. So I'm a Rabbi Yaakov, the Rabbi Yirmiya, Bar Tachlifa, Ezber He says, I'm going to explain this to you a little better. Everyone agrees that you can definitely put the protrusion out. The protrusion was there in the first place. You can put the protrusion out after. It's totally fine. There's no way. In other words, if I move my wall so that I can put the protrusion and it's not going into the public domain, there's nothing to stop me from doing that. However, keep Paligi, the Machlokan, it's not like we thought before. In other words, that really, you're allowed to block. The question is, the question is, what if I took down my wall and I moved it over and then I want to move it back? And not only that, but the positions flip. Rabbi Yochanan says you can't put the wall back. And Rish Lakish says you can't. So why? Rabbi Yochanan says you can't. So why? He holds like Rabbi Yehuda who said, once you open something to the public, you can't put it back. You can't ruin it again. So once you move your wall in, that really opened up space for people. So you can't go blocking that off again. How does he deal with this other He says, That's when there's no space in the Rishad Arabim. That's if you, you know, there was a shortcut through your field. So once people use it as a shortcut, you can't block it off anymore. But, but here, this was just an overflow of the public domain. 
That's not the same thing. So there you can stop people. Lakach chatzir. Uba, so, I'm um, sorry, there you can actually insist on putting your wall back. So that's what Rish Lakish said. So now what happens though? You buy a courtyard, there's already a um, merpeset or, or beams jutting out into the public domain. You can leave it, even though you can't do it from the gates from the start. But if you bought a place, there already was, again, facts on the ground created here. Amar Hun. And not only that, but if it falls, you can put it back up. To which the Gemara says, Metive, but wait, we're going to have a contradiction. From here, we're going to get totally sidetracked till the end of the chapter. Okay, you can't plaster a house. You can't put up, um, like put pictures in the wall. Okay, like the response says, besit. Or it could be also siyud, it's just a more wider plastering. And if I famous surot siponim, okay, what exactly these are? There's some kind of painting that you're doing to your house to beautify it. You can't do this bizman hazim. What's the issue here? This is because of avelut of the temple. This was in the time right after the destruction of the temple. They instituted all sorts of things that we don't really keep today, although we do keep a little some of them. But you don't do this bizman hazim. But, but if you bought something already with these, with this plastering, painting, pretty designs, you can keep it as is. Here comes the contradiction. However, if the house falls or the walls fall, you can't build it the way it was before. So how do we resolve Fred reconcile? In our case, you're not allowed to do it, but if it fell, you're allowed to, re if you buy it already like that, you can keep it. And if it fell, you can rebuild it. And this, you can't rebuild, to which the Gemara says, you're comparing apples and oranges. That's forbidden. Again, it's not by Torah law or anything, but it's Zecher L'Chorban to remember the destruction of the temple, you know, to have a sense of mourning, we forbid it. Therefore, if it breaks, you can't rebuild it the way it was. That's forbidden. But here we're talking about neighborly relations and what the neighbor permitted, and that's a whole different realm. Again, sort of ending this chapter with the same we had in Baba Metzia, at the end of Baba Metzia, with Mamon and Isur are not the same thing. Okay, we're talking here and stressing the uniqueness of our Masechet, that it's about relationships between people, and that's much different than things that are forbidden, per se, prohibitions. If we're already on this topic, so now we're going to have a whole detailed thing about all different things that we do on account of the destruction or don't do to remember the destruction. Tanu Rabbanan, so the Brighter says, Lo yasud adam beto besid. So again, don't plaster your house. If you mix sand or um, straw, you can do that. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, irei bochol hareze tarkesid. If you mix sand in it, it actually makes it stronger and better. That's forbidden, because again, you have to do it not in a, in a nice way. Teven mutal, but if you do it with teven, it's actually permitted because that just darkens it and it doesn't look pretty anymore. Tanu Rabbanan, another bright. Kishacharav, okay, these are all bright toad again. The bright toad are written soon after the destruction of the temple and you can feel it in the air, you know, and the, the, the destruction was still felt so strongly and they wanted to maintain that feeling of, you know, and having the people understand this sense of loss. Okay, so all these people who decided we're going to separate ourselves, that's what they're called, Prushim, separate themselves from not eating meat and not drinking wine. Okay, they said when the second temple was destroyed. So Rabbi Yeshua starts engaging in a discussion with them. Why are you eating meat and why are you drinking wine? Amrulo, they said to him, Nochal basar shemimenu makrivim al-gabe mizbeach v'achshav batel, what we can eat, meat, that used to be brought on the altar and now we can't? Nishte yayin, we're going to bring drink wine? Shemin aschim al-gabe mizbeach v'achshav batel, that once they poured libations on the altar and now we can't? No way, we're not going to eat those things because they remind us of things in the temple that we can no longer do. Wouldn't be appropriate. Amar lahem, im ken, lechem lo nochal, well then you should eat bread. Shikvar batlu menachot. Because there's no meal offerings anymore. And meal offerings were like bread. So they said, you're right. So we'll eat fruits only. 
says to them, Rabbi Yeshua, according to you, you can't eat fruits either. Shekfar batlum bikurim. Because we used to bring fruits for bikurim. Efshar beperot acherim. Well, only the seven species that the Jew, that Israel was blessed with. You have to bring bikurim. So fine, we won't have bikurim, but we won't eat those fruits. We'll have other fruits. We still have what to eat. To which he says, Mayim lo nishkeh. Well, then you shouldn't drink water. We shouldn't drink water. Shekfar batel nisua hamayim. Because on Sukkot, you might remember, there's the water libations, which were also poured there on the altar. Shatku, they had nothing to say. And basically what Rabbi Yeshua was trying to say is you've gone overboard, right? There's a there's a limit to, you know, how far we go with this. So, Amar lahem banai bo v'omar lahem shaloli tabel kolikar yefshal. So he says, so listen, let me explain to you. We can't not mourn at all. That would be impossible. Because this terrible thing happened and we can't just ignore it. But you also can't do too much mourning because we don't put something too difficult on the people. We don't put ordinances, forbid things that are permitted when the majority of the people can't stand up to this. How do we know this? It's a very hard pasuk to understand, but it's a it's a pasuk in Malachi, where the people apparently had made a gzera, okay, this is the way the Rashbam explained, they had made a gzera to bring, people weren't bringing Truman to Maslow, they said, well, everyone's going to have to bring it to this place, and then it's, and then curse will be anyone who doesn't, and then it says, atem you will be cursed by this curse, but atem kovim, you're stealing from me, God, because you're not giving these gifts, hagoi kulo, the whole nation, meaning the whole nation accepted upon themselves, this idea about bringing the Truman to in that time, and and that really what they accepted was that anyone will be, well, we had to bring Truman to anyway, but anyone will be cursed if they don't bring them. And then you're basically going to be punished because this was something that everyone accepted. So what do you see? We only do Zerot if Hagoi Kulo, if the whole nation accepts it upon themselves. Ella, Kacham Ruch Hachamim. So now Rabbi Yeshua continues and he says, fine, I'm going to give you the boundaries of what we can do, what we can't do. The rabbi said, Sad Adam et You can actually paint your house. You just have to leave one small part. This is what many people meant um, customary to do nowadays based on this. But comma, what part do you leave undone? Right? How much? Yosef says it's one by one, and Rav Chista says it's by the entrance so that everyone can see it. You can make a nice, beautiful meal, but you leave over something. Okay, what he's basically saying is you can live your life, but make small changes. What is this? Like, for example, don't have the fish that's fried in, in, in breadcrumbs or something like that, some flour. Okay, it's some sort of fish dish comes up a lot in the Gemara. Something that's noticeable, but not too much. Women can wear all the jewelry, makeup, everything they want, but they leave over one thing. Okay, it was something having to do with her temples. Okay, whether it was um, uh, the Rashbam says they would remove hair by the temples, and so that they stopped doing. Not exactly sure what he's referring to. Where do we get this from? Okay, this is where we get the breaking of the glass, um, which doesn't appear at all in these sources. Appears much much later. The truth is, I, I don't remember now where, where the first source is, so don't quote me on it, but it definitely doesn't come up in this Gemara. But if I forget the Jerusalem, I'll forget my right hand and my my palate, my tongue should be stuck to my palate. My arosh simchati, what is that? What does it mean? What does it mean to raise up Jerusalem? On my my head, the head of my simcha. What does that mean? My happiness. This is ashes that they put on the on the husband. Some people have the custom to do this, which they would put right. So where did would they put it? Where would they put it? Where you put your tefillin? How do we get this? There's a pasuk in Yeshayahu. Lasum laavelet peel the Evelet Sion are going to put the Pe'er, which is often understood as the Tefillin, instead of the Efer. So there you see that the Efer went in the place where the Tefillin went, right? So in the front of the forehead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Anyone who mourns for Jerusalem, 
And here they say why it's so important to mourn, because if you mourn for Jerusalem properly, you will actually see, you will rejoice in the rebuilding of it. A beautiful concept. Shneemar simchu et Yerushalayim, right? And what does it say in the pasuk? You have to read the whole thing. Begilu ba kol ohaveha, right? And they'll be happy, all the people who love it. Sisu atam asos kol hamitablim aleha. All those who mourn it, they're the ones who will rejoice. And another bright side that we'll finish up with. Amar Tanya, Amar Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, miyom shachara beit hamikdash, dinu shenigzor al asmenu shalol lachol basar velo lashot yayin. It says, by law, we really should have stopped eating meat, stop drinking wine like those people mentioned previously. So like Rabbi Yoshua, he says, but we can't decree something that people can't stand, stand up to. Once the Romans came in and really started doing terrible things to us, they put upon us difficult things that we can't do all sorts of things. We can't keep the mitzvot and the Torah the way we want to. And they don't allow us to go to do a brit milah, to go into a brit milah, or to go to a pidyon haben. Most people think it's a pidyon haben, Yeshua haben. It's like saving the baby from the womb. Some people think it's the shalom zachal. The source for it here comes up in another studio also. Well, once they told us not to do mitzvot and we can't do circumcisions, and and pidyon abens better that we not have children at all, and we should not get married and not have children. So forget about you know not eating meat and wine. Maybe one could refrain from doing that. But right, there's vegans out there, vegetarians who don't do it anyway, and people who don't drink wine. But to not get married and not have children, which also people don't do, but the majority of the world does do that. Abraham avinu right and and. If we did that, right, theoretically, we should have done that. And then we would have killed ourselves out, basically. Or, right, so first of all, some people say, what do you mean? What happened to the mitzvah of period Rivia? Don't you have to do that? Some people say, well, they mean have one, one son, one daughter fulfill the mitzvah and then stop. Okay, it's, it's a little hard to say that because it says don't get married, but okay. Um, right, he's also, I think, not really being, not saying this really would have been the halakha, but he's saying, I could see that someone might claim this kind of a thing. But, and you're going to be surprised, I was surprised by his punchline, right? You would say, but we don't do that because, right, it's too much or people won't keep to that, right? Well, what he's going to say is like this. It's more than, but it, it takes it one step farther. Because people can't live up to that, so they're going to do it anyway. And therefore, very famous line, and it comes up in a bunch of other sugyo. And one by jewelry of women, you might remember, Masachat Shabbat. Leave the Jews better that they do it with shogeg, unwittingly, not realizing it's forbidden, than doing it intentionally. So basically, since we know people are going to get married anyway and have children, we may as well just let them do it. Because if we forbid it and then they do it anyway, they'll be intentional sinners. So better not to make a gzera that's going to cause people to sin, right? Better to just leave it and not, not make an, an ordinance here. Which is very interesting because he really seems to be saying that really we shouldn't drink wine, we shouldn't have meat, we shouldn't even be getting married, which is crazy. But because of this, right, it's, it's always like a bit of a cop out because if the people really do know, like you're learning this, then does that mean you're not allowed to do this? So hopefully that's not what it means. Um, but it is an interesting way to end the chapter with that. Hadran Allah has caught up a team and we end the chapter. Now, why do we end with the temple and the destruction of the temple? Right, it's interesting because we've been talking about all these neighbor relations and um, and and being kind to each other. Right, I was thinking this, this kind of reminds us of the sin atrinam that they say it was such baseless hatred that caused the destruction of the temple and the people didn't get along with each other. And maybe that's why they're referencing. And they specifically said the, the end of the second temple time period. That's when they institute all these things. Well, it makes sense because there wasn't such a strong rabbinic uh, ordinances and all that going on after the first temple. It's a different kind of time period. But also perhaps they're saying a lot of these ordinances were instituted to remind us of the destruction, to remind us of what brought us to the destruction, which was not getting along with each other. And that's why it ends this chapter with which all these arguments about people, about land ownership and, a, you know, one person lying, one person, you know, and, and trying to get along. And really it ends this whole first section of the, of the Masechet about all the neighborhood, neighborly relations 
and getting along with other people. So perhaps that's why there's a reference to the destruction of the temple here with a whole big section. Uh, anyway, we'll end with that. Um, we'll do a quick review. So we started about the people in the courtyard and taking up space, right? It'd take up space in a different courtyard, how you split the house. Um, we then talked about opening windows and the issues there and about Bilam. We had the quote that showed how much people were careful about privacy and about the bigger and the smaller, about taking up more space in the courtyard. We saw some different issues going on there. Then we went to, um, do you have to worry about future damage, like building a pit in the ground and things jutting out from your your area into the public domain. We talked about moving things. We talked about, right, we had those funny cases of the rabbis where each one had a case that was kind of similar or maybe exactly similar to what he had. And then, you know, each time their reaction to um, what they do, right? One who went in the middle of the night to cut his tree so he didn't have an issue. And then the whole machlok at Rabbi Yochanan reached Lakish about if you moved your wall, can you move it back, right? First, we thought it was moving the seas and you didn't rebuild it, but then we moved on to explain it differently. From there, we had um, the, the um, if you buy it though, it's already like that, you're allowed to keep it like that. And then they brought the contradiction with the sugya about the zechel korban, all those things to remember the destruction. And there, you can't rebuild and paint a nice wall if you knocked one down. Even if it had nice pictures on it, you can't rebuild it the way it was because that's Isur and this is Mamon. Just one big thing we wanted to end with. And then from there, we got into all these kind of debates they had after the destruction about how we treat the korban, how we bring it into our daily lives, how far we go to mourn or balance it with what people can handle. And with that, we finish for today, wishing everyone a Shabbat Shalom and a Shavuot Tov.